Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous program? This program that is completely dedicated to be helping us to become better and better acquainted with this most marvelous, this most wonderful, this most awesome, this most terrible book, the Bible. How can I say that? It's so wonderful, it's so awesome, and yet so terrible. Because the Bible is God's book to mankind and tells us, and that's you and me, every human being, something that is the last thing we want to hear. And that is we're sinners. And that sin means that we're under the judgment of God because we have to answer to God for our sins. We were created, the Bible tells us, assures us absolutely, we're not created like the animals. Oh yes, they were created by God also, but they were created as as uh, bodies with the breath of life in them, and mankind ha does have a body with the breath of life, but also mankind was created with a soul or spirit essence, which we can't see, we can't uh, analyze, we can't uh, uh, put it out on the table and, and carve it apart and see what it's made of. No, it's, it's very mysterious, it is, but it is a very integral part of our life. And, and uh, uh, because we were created in the likeness of God, we were also... Uh, created to exist forevermore. An animal dies, that's the end. It is like it has been annihilated, it, like it had never existed. That's why the death of an animal is not a tragedy. That animal is never going to suffer again. It, uh, it, when that animal dies or has to be put to sleep for whatever reason or is killed for its food, uh, it, uh, that animal simply ceases to exist. But when man dies, oh my, it's something altogether different because there still is a life after death. It's interesting, you know, when you study the ancients, uh, the ancient Egyptians or whoever they are, they knew there was a life after death. They made provision for their pharaohs, uh, what they are going to do uh, when uh, uh, or how they're going to live in, in the life after death, wherever that may be, although they had no idea what it was all about. Even the Indians of our land used to talk about the happy hunting grounds uh, that you would go to when you died. And uh, animals can't think that way because they were not created to live that way. But mankind, deep, deep in his heart, he knows there is a life after death. And, but he also knows there's a God that he has to answer to. And therefore, he is very, very apprehensive by what he finds in the Bible. And we would rather not open the Bible at all. Or if I'm going to open the Bible, I'd like to just stick with those verses uh, that uh, that uh, I can cope with, I can live with, I can be happy with, but I don't want to read anything and everything in the Bible. But you know, the wonder of it is that today, as we come right near the end of time, uh, we uh, God has opened our eyes so that we can read more and more of the Bible with some understanding, and we discover that indeed God does have a magnificent plan of saving a great many people, a vast, a great multitude which no man can number. The Bible uses that kind of language, and from everything we know in the Bible, it is what is happening today, even as the world itself and the church world and all are on their way to their a uh, time when they, each individual there, have to spend, etern uh, be judged and found guilty. But 
This is why we want to know more and more about this. What, what about me if I'm not saved? Is there any hope for me? Is there anything that I can do? You know, we have an interesting question from a listener in China, uh, and where we have many listeners. What, if God is omnipotent, omnipotent means all-powerful, is it not possible for him to save all the people in the world, even including the devils, and destroy hell uh, with his great power, that is, with God's great power and kindness, uh, surely wouldn't that be possible? Well, that's, that's the way we would look at it. If I were God, I would be tempted. Yes, indeed, why, why all this ugly business of, of God's wrath and, and, and hell, eternal damnation? Oh, how sorrowful that is. Why can't that all be set aside? The problem is that God is a God of law, of law. In other words, God cannot just by divine decree do this or do that. When God has established his laws, he must keep these laws. We don't normally think about this, but the very laws that we read in the Bible to which we are subjected are the very laws that God is subjected to. And you know, if a, God has decreed in his law book that if a man re, rebels against God or a devil a re, or an angel rebels against God, as the fallen angels did who became the devils or the evil spirits, then there must be a penalty. And that penalty is an awful penalty because the sin of rebellion is so awful it means eternal damnation, to be eternally damned in hell. My, my, that's so unacceptable to mankind. What a terrible penalty. But God has no way around it. That law stands. And so God cannot, by, by divine decree, just because he is God of gods and Lord of lords, that he can now set that law aside and say, Oh, my, my, given the fact that the whole human race has gone, uh, has become sinful, and because so many of the angels have fallen into sin and have become the devils, surely I ought to change that law. God cannot change that law. It is cast uh, forevermore and cannot be changed. So, God has to work through that law to achieve his purpose, that out of this miserable mass of humankind, he might have some people for himself. We don't know how many of the uh, people that uh, uh, is. We do know uh, that during the Old Testament days, uh, there were not very many, not very many, that actually did, God gave uh, provision to have them escape hell. We know that throughout the church age, there were also quite a number, but again, not in great numbers that came to uh, know a way in which they could escape hell. But it's in our day, oh, glory be, it's in our day that God is teaching there is a great multitude that will become saved and and uh, they were found all, sprinkled all through the world. God has set up all, the, his whole program to get the gospel to him. And remember that everyone, whether it was an, a lone individual in the Old Testament, uh, like uh, Abraham and his tiny family, or whether it was Noah and his tiny family, uh, uh, the fact is that, that, or whether it is the a group of people that were saved at Pentecost, let's say in A.D. 33, when about 3,000 were saved, or today, as there are, as there are, as there is a great multitude that are coming uh, to know salvation, uh, truly become saved. It is all by the mercy of God, and all of these were chosen from the foundation of the world. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not. 
uh, here to uh, continue to develop this because we wouldn't have an open forum program. But these are the kind of things. They're super serious, super serious that we talk about on this program and invite discussion about. And our only authority is the Bible. The Bible. Family Radio is not the authority. I'm not the authority. There is no other authority but God, and God has given us the answers in the Bible. But we have to search it out. We have to follow the rules that God has laid down in order to truly discover truth from the Bible. But so we thank you, China, for that very leading question. And now shall we take our first call tonight, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. I had a question regarding the timeline. Yes. Um, in, in the beginning, um, there's someone that says it called his name. That means it was a direct son, so you'd have to take that, that age at, at the direct son, right? If God, yes, if God used that uh, formula of uh, so-and-so called his name thus and so, we would know by that 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 was a direct son. And on the other hand, if we, uh, or sometimes he might not have used that, but there's quite a lot of other evidence in the Bible that it was a direct son. But on the other hand, if none of these two things apply, uh, that he's not called, the, the term called his name is not used, nor is there any other direct evidence that show it is a, an immediate son. We must assume it could be a son, a grandson, a great-grandson, a great-grandson. We don't know. We, we, it can be any of these things. Okay, so like now when we start the timeline, like Adam, I have 130, Seth 105, um, Enos 905, Enos 905, but then after that it, it starts going, um, then you have to put um, the whole age because it doesn't have, it just says begat. It doesn't say he called his name. So then we would right. put um, the, whole a, the whole age of the person because then the next person would be born after he died, the same year he died. Is that correct? That is correct because you see, uh, that is a calendar, and and uh, we learned from a careful study of Exodus 6, God gives us a, a, the definition there of how he has developed the calendar as he works through the lifespans of, uh, of uh, uh, four men. One was uh, uh, Levi, one was Kohath, another Lamech, and uh, then Aaron. And uh, they are the, that's the only uh, timeline that exists through that period of 430 years that Israel was in Egypt. And by it, God is defining how he kept the calendars uh, during, uh, throughout the church age. He's giving us instruction how to look at that, those begats, how they relate to each other. Right, like I have Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah at the at the flood. Would that be correct? Yes. Oh, okay, and then I had one more question. Yes. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and she wants me to ask you um, if ballet dancing is okay. Well, now, let's think about that. The ballet dancing, and that's a fair question. The fact is that what is the rule for the child of God? We're not talking about the rule for the world, what the world likes or believes is wholesome or, or whatever. We have to ask, what is, uh, what is God desire? And the Bible says, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Now, ballet dancing is done in a way to, in, to really... Uh, 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 look at the wonder of a person's body and how they are able to do this and do that and it's really there's nothing about it really to God's glory it's really to man's glory so it's very very difficult to conclude 
uh, that ballet dancing is really to the praise of God. It it may uh, uh, be attractive to mankind; they may be delighted by it, but uh, it still probably is not nearly as as uh, 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 reprehensible, for example, as as uh, other kind of dancing, which can be very sexually oriented, or can be where one man has got a uh, someone in his arms that is not his wife, and that, of course, is totally contrary to the Word of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. If you know, I know parents who have uh, children, and they want to really. Uh, uh, help their children to become very nice social people and so on and so they think it would be wise to have ballet dancing but I think before they uh, to give that uh, child uh, ballet dancing lessons but I think before they do that they should do a lot of praying uh, is this really to the glory of God or is this simply to the glory of man and incidentally that points to other things too when someone really uh, works night and day to aspire in sports or whatever uh, you have to ask questions is this really to the glory of God or is this uh, simply to enhance my pride and my glory look how great I am and when you take all of that out of it then there isn't a whole lot left but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hey I'm really glad that you were able to take my call um, I, you had last week you had someone call in and they were having a problem with being gay and I was just wondering in the beginning when God created man and he put man under the in the sleep, and he took a rib from Adam. Man, didn't he have to find a female character there, characteristic in that man? And don't we all have that same kind of characteristic within us as a men? And female also, they have a male characteristic. And also, I noticed, I've been listening to you, and I, I've heard that about salvation. Um, in Gospel of John, talks about even if you believe on his name that you will be saved. Now, I'll let you answer. I won't, you know, say anything else, but um, I'm interested in knowing what you have to say about that, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, you're correct, of course, that uh, men and women are very similar in many ways. But on the other hand, there is a point where they are not similar, and that is no man can bear a child. Only a woman can bear a child, and God talks about men and women, and the two become one flesh. And then to make sure that there's no misunderstanding about this matter, that someone might want to fudge a little bit and say, well, you know, we really, really are quite similar anyway. God says very specifically in Leviticus 18, verse 22, and, and the, remember, this is God speaking. This is the law of God, and there are no modifications anywhere in the Bible about this law. In verse 22 of Leviticus 18, God declares, Thou shalt not lie with Mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. Okay, we can rationalize, we can say, well, that's not reasonable or whatever. But it doesn't change the fact that that is the command of God. And we can argue, we can, we can say that doesn't make sense and so on. And people do that all the time with the laws of God. We don't like them. It's just like today. There are many laws that our government makes and we don't like. So a lot of people take the law into their own hands. They cheat on their income taxes. They, uh, they cheat on their driving. They cheat on this and that and the other thing because they think they know more than the law of the land. And we, uh, that's... Yeah, God, of course, knows we, we, we can hide it from our government, but we can't hide our, our, our failings and our, and our law breaking, but we can't hide from God because God knows the heart of every individual. Now, in connection with your 
Second question, uh, yeah, the problem is if we trust in his name. But you have to rem remember, we, the Bible defines its own language. And when we go through the Bible, we find that the only ones that, uh, well, first of all, that, that God expands that statement a whole lot. As he says, we're to love God with all our heart and soul and mind. That we are to seek him with all our heart and, uh, and soul or spirit. And the fact is, nobody can do that. Nobody will do that. Because even though we try desperately to do the will of God, the fact is that that there's still sin, and we can be as perfect as we think we are, so that we can think we're virtually absolutely perfect, which of course none of us could ever even begin to attain to. But assuming you could, if there were just one tiny sin. The Bible, as a law book, declares you're still under the wrath of God. There has to be payment for that sin. That means that uh, anything we do still requires the fact that God has to uh, take our sins, whatever they may be, and no normally they're horrendous, they're terrible, they're mul there is a multitude of them, and had to lay them upon a sin bearer who turns out to be the Lord Jesus Christ, find, make him guilty for our sins, and then pour out God's wrath on him in making payment for our sins as he becomes our sin bearer. And we can't do that. We can't uh, make God do that for anybody. And God is under obligation not to do that to do that for anybody but God did decide that he would do it for certain ones and the Bible tells us he chose them from before the foundation of the earth and so at some time in their life uh, as they are, are, are under the reading of the Bible or the hearing of the word of God uh, God can make them his creature, give them a brand new resurrected soul or spirit essence so that they are loving God with all their heart and soul and mind. That is, uh, uh, God now looks at them as if there is no sin in their life. And so they have become saved. And so they will be trusting in his name in accordance with all the nuances and all the uh, uh, the uh, understanding of what the Bible is talking about. Uh, even though that person himself may not have known immediately that he even had become saved. But he will find in his life, because he's been given a new resurrected soul, a tremendous desire to do the will of God. It won't be... Uh, oh, I'm hanging in there to do the will of God. Oh, I'm struggling to do the will of God. Oh, it's a tough struggle. No, it'll be increasingly the, uh, the right thing to do. I'm only happiest when I'm doing the will of God, when I'm searching out from the Bible how am I to live. This is what I want to do, and that can only come when God saves us. And we can't get ourselves saved. We have to wait upon God. Maybe, maybe, maybe I too, if I'm not presently saved, can still become saved. And that maybe is pretty wonderful today because God talks about our day and says very specifically right in our day that there's a great multitude which no man can number that are coming into the body of Christ. But thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey there, Brother Camping. While some folks might wear a scarlet letter to a Christian nation and others jump from the bridge over troubled waters, my two questions concern the apocalyptic worldview of which you are a grand master. First, as a sign of the end times, should believers condone the chaos, confusion, death, and destruction caused by the combination of conservative politics and radical religion? 
Well, what is your question? You're, in other words, are you saying that the evidence of the end time is the uh, is the thing that's happening in politics and all the different religions and so on? Is that what you're saying? I'm asking you if the things that are going on in the world are a sign of the end times. Oh, well, uh, 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 that's a very good question. First of all, we never build theology or or, or try to determine the teaching of uh, really no truth from looking out in the world because we we don't have clear enough vision as to understand what's happening in the world. We have to start with the Bible. And so when we start with the Bible, we find the Bible is becoming increasingly clear that as we, at, in our day, the churches should be turning away for faster and faster away from the truth of the Bible, that they are sounding less and less like they really are trusting the whole Word of God. And in the world, we should find that there is a vast increase in wickedness. And lo and behold, when we look out in the world, we find these things happening. We find these things happening. We find that churches, uh, if we compare, if we look uh, in, in all honesty at the whole church situation, the Christian church situation, uh, which, in, which actually covers about a third of the population of the world, approximately about two billion people, we find that the situation is a whole lot different than it was 50 years ago, for example. Uh, there are women now teaching and preaching, which did not, which hardly ever occurred back then. Uh, there is uh, way more entertainment in the churches. There's far more. Uh, uh, the, the music has degraded a whole lot. It sounds way more like the world's music. We find that, that uh, there's not teaching about hell and damnation. Uh, nearly as much as it used to be, and so on. We can go on and on. There's a big change. And secondly, we find we find that in the world, uh, uh, the wickedness is is you know, fantastic. Uh, it, you all you have to do is open your newspaper each day, and and all it is is one crime after another being offered, and and there's. Uh, uh, wickedness in high places in the pol political world. Uh, there's wickedness in every nation, killing and so on. It all follows what the Bible predicted. We're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to open forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Good evening. I'm calling because um, I have a question regarding um, the Sabbath. I'm not on that. I'm not able to get a clear understanding of, of exactly which day should we worship on. Now, according to my religion, to, to my belief, we are to worship on the seventh day, which is on a Saturday, um, Sunday being the first day of the week. So why is it that the majority of the world follows Sunday as the Sabbath day? The reason is that you are following the creeds or the doctrines of your gospel, which, which uh, is not c correctly following the Bible. The, the, by, the creeds of any church, I don't care what denomination is, are not the final authority ever. They are not the ultimate authority. The Bible is. And we have to look at these questions very carefully in, yeah, and see how God deals with in, this in the Bible. And when we search out this question and take into account, and we have to, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy task to do frequently. It means comparing a lot of Scripture with a lot of Scripture. But when we finally sort it out, we find that the seventh-day Sabbath, which was commanded on Mount Sinai uh, uh, when God gave the Ten Commandments, 
uh, and was to be observed rigorously, religiously, so that if any man worked at all, even the tiniest little bit of work on the Saturday the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, they were to be put to death. And we wonder why, why such a horrendous punishment for such a tiny, uh, just a tiny infraction of that law. And then when we search it out, uh, both going through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find that that seventh day Sabbath was like the laws that had to do with the offering of burnt offerings and blood sacrifices and certain feast days. They were looking at some aspect of uh, God's salvation plan just as a picture or as a portrait. But there was no spiritual substance within them. In other words, uh, the fact that someone worshipped on the seventh day or did not work on the seventh day or the fact that someone offered a lamb uh, for a burnt offering or a blood sacrifice did not help that person become saved at all. They are simply, these their laws were to be observed as a sign pointing to some aspect of God's salvation plan. Now, in the case of the Seventh-day Sabbath, we, when we sort it out carefully, we find that it, that law was given to indicate we're not to do any work to get ourselves saved. We have to remember all the work of salvation has to be God's work. Now, once Christ went to the cross... And he did the work of saving us, and he fulfilled the uh, the uh, uh, sac- the uh, sacrifice of lambs and burnt offerings and so on. We don't observe those any longer. They had simply been a shadow, as we read in Second Corinthians chapter two, uh, uh, or, uh, or rather Colossians chapter two. Uh, they were, oh boy, now I quoted a verse, and I better check it. I've, Make sure that I got that right. I don't like to uh, make mistakes, if possible. In Second, uh, in Colossians chapter 2, we read in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. In other words, they had no spiritual substance in them. And so when we get to the last day of the Old Testament Sabbath, which was the day that Christ was in the tomb, he, his body did not see corruption, uh, there was no work being done anymore because he had done all the work to save us. And then early on Sunday morning, The Bible tells us that early in the morning, uh, uh, and I'm reading now from Matthew chapter 28, as it should be translated. Unfortunately, it was not translated carefully enough in our King James Bible, but in Luke, uh, in Matthew 28, and I could look at other verses also, Mm -hmm. but in Matthew 28, in the end of the Sabbath, plural, what end of Sabbath? Well, the end of an era of seventh-day Sabbaths, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbaths, not the first of the week, but the first of the Sabbaths. Uh, that's exactly the way it has to be translated. Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. In other words, just like the burnt offerings were finished, so the seventh-day Sabbath was finished. And now God instituted a new Sabbath day, which was entirely different than the seventh-day Sabbath. It was not a sign pointing to to uh, Christ going to the cross. It was for our own spiritual uh, uh, benefit. So there is no particular day for worship. Every day is a worship day. Well, we should worship every day, but... Am I understanding that correctly? There is no set-aside particular day that you must um, well, attend that's, church. That, that's the way a lot of 
uh, preachers teach it, but that's not they're not listening to the Bible. They're listening to their own church dogma, their own church creeds. The fact is, we find that God set aside the first day of the week as the day of worship. And he did it for our good. Because uh, normally, throughout the world, people have to uh, work very hard from sunup until sundown, uh, scratching out enough uh, existence so they are enough income so they can have some kind of a meager existence. But come the the period of the first day no god says that's my day when you are to do my will and uh, and you have no obligation to work and because we are spiritual beings and we need that time in order to uh, to uh, work uh, to uh, uh, read the bible and to uh, uh, pray and to talk with our families about God and talk with others about God. That that this is the, the true understanding of how we are to follow on the first day. But uh, what you are saying is not untypical. There are all kinds of crazy doctrines and wrong doctrines that are afloat, but they're there because the theologians who have con- propounded these or or set them up. Uh, have not read the Bible carefully enough. But thank okay, you. Great. Thank you I for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camden? Yes. Yes, I was, I was calling you about my, my wife, okay, and she was telling, um, she. We've been married, we have seven kids and everything, and then I asked her, um, she, she got involved with somebody else, and she said she's in love with the person. But I said, that couldn't come from God. And she said, that love came from God. And I wanted to see what scriptures I can tell her yeah, that yeah. Um, it could never come from God. Well, I don't know if I understand you. Are you saying that your wife is in love with someone else? She says she's in love with me still, but she's in love with somebody else. Yeah. And she she was also a Christian, but she fell in love with you uh, see, this guy. And I said, there's no way that you come from God, though. Well, you see, uh, first of all, in our society and in our day our definition of love is very very corrupted we love pie bear a blueberry pie or we love uh, uh, a certain color or we love uh, uh, this or we love that we just use the love word love very promiscuously but God defines the word love very carefully the word loves means that we have an intense desire to do the will of God. To love God means we want to do the will of God. To love our fellow man means we want to obey all of God's laws as we deal with our fellow man. Now, if she is saying, I love this other individual, obvious, and, and, is, and she's thinking in terms of romance in any way. Now, uh, we can love a child, we can want the very best for that child, we can love a friend, wanting the very best for that friend. But if there's any tinge of romance, of uh, sexual impurity in that love, then we are in terrible disagreement with the law of God. Because the Bible says that if if we look after a, 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 the opposite sex, if a man looks at a woman with uh, lust in his heart at all, even though he has n- never touches that woman, never gets close to her. But if he just s- looks at her and has a desire to have uh, intimacy with that woman, uh, then he has already committed adultery. And that's not love in any sense. And so... Uh, the uh, when we say we uh, when a woman says I love a man she normally means I am romantically attracted to that individual and if it's not her husband she's in deep trouble with God she is violating the law of God now however 
You don't have to think, no, well, no, there's my wife. She's a despicable sinner. I'm glad I'm not that. We got to be very careful. We do know that any place we look, we're going to see sin. But we'll also uh, see sin as we look in the mirror. And you want to make for sure, first of all, that in your life, you are living in a way that is pleasing to God. That you, your uh, uh, love for God includes the idea. Oh, I, I'm only happy when I do the will of God. And and that's why I, I search out the Bible and I read the Bible and I'm interested in the Bible because I want to know more and more what God's that, will is. That's what, that's what I told her. But she she felt that um, oh, that love, I asked her, that love had, it couldn't come from God. The only love that can come from God because he gave us um, love when we got married. God just love when it comes um, when God gives us love. And I asked, I asked her that, and uh, she has a friend that she goes, and that's the opposite sex. And I feel that um, that's when it started because um, she went to this friend talking to him, and he always she always talked to him and everything or whatever. And I said that too is a violation. Well, you're, you're, excuse me, you're not going to argue your wife in the truth. None of us can. We have loved ones. We have uh, dear ones that we, oh, we just love them. We want the highest good for them. Uh, and yet we cannot argue anybody in the truth. God has to open their spiritual eyes. And so all you can do is be glad that you can talk to your wife about these things and then pray but she for don't her. Want to talk. She doesn't want to talk about it. She only talks about it to her guy friend. She yeah, doesn't well, want to talk about it well, with me. Okay, of course she doesn't want to, because she deep, deep in her heart, she knows there's something wrong about this altogether. But, and you have to, you, she's still your wife, and you know, yeah, you, have to, her, you have to, you have to. What I'm saying is because I have my love for God, I love God more than anything. Yeah, well, you, but excuse that's me. That's what I'm saying. You have to, you have mm -hmm. to keep forgiving and forgiving and pray for her that somehow God will have mercy on her and open her spiritual eyes. That's, that, and, and in the meanwhile, ask yourself the question, am I the best husband in the world? Am I doing it God's way? And one thing I like to encourage all of us husbands, I'm a husband also, and so I can speak very, very personally to this. Uh, we should be reading Ephesians chapter 5 uh, for uh, uh, every every week again uh, where God uh, declares uh, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now that's a big admonition to me. And to every husband, do I look with uh, with eyes of love upon my wife that I want always to do the will of God? And and I'm am I willing to d deny myself in order to um, uh, uh, show uh, that that I want the very best for my wife? And that's a real good place to start in any family relationship. In other words, it begins with me, not with my wife, whom I might see a sin in. It begins with me. I want to first be sure that I am doing it God's way. But thank you for calling and sharing. That's Ephesians 5, verse 25. Become very well acquainted with that. Ephesians 5, verse 25. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Kevin. Yes. I just wanted to first extend an apology and amends to you because I've listened to you up and on, and I used to want to believe that the church age wasn't over. And then after you said, like you say, don't believe you, but match, look, it in the, look it up in the Word of God, the Bible. And when I looked it up, man, <clears throat> you could see that the church age has come because the churches today have perverted the gospel. And Paul, Paul actually warns us in Galatians chapter 1, and also in, um, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 11, that they're going to be coming with another gospel. 
and that we might we might well bear with them if we be, we were to believe what they were, what they were saying. Yeah, well, that's exactly what happens. And in other words, that's why I keep telling people, don't trust me. I will tell you what I believe the Bible is saying, but I'll I'll try to back it up with Scripture so you can search it out in the Scripture for yourself. And then when you begin to seriously read the Bible about these things, you'll find that that is the situation, that there's something terrible that's going on in the churches today. And I also heard you say that uh, Satan is now sitting in the temple of the churches. And in Second Corinthians 11, it's pretty clear because it says in the verse 4, But if he that come preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with it. And then when we drop down further, he warned, gives us the final warning. He says, For such are false apostles, they're deceitful workers, they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ, and, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great mystery that the ministers also be fashioned as the ministers of righteousness, who then shall be according to their work. You're right on. That's what God is saying, and it uh, it fits today like a hand fits into a glove. It uh, This is what is happening in our day. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Yes, my question to you tonight is this. I've been reading through the... Uh, uh, the new book, well, it's actually not that new anymore, the book that you recently wrote. And uh, I was just looking at a verse in, in uh, concerning the flood where I don't remember the exact uh, uh, verse, but it talks about when the ark landed on dry land. It talks about the first month, the first day. I think, uh, I don't know if it says about the year, but... Um, I, is there any tie-in with that? I'm, I'm sure there is, concerning the end time. Or the I, time I, of- I have been unable to determine a tie-in. I do know that God did give us some very specific instruction uh, that the ark, that the the flood waters prevailed. First of all, they they were uh, coming upon the earth over a period of forty days. The Bible gives specific instruction that after 150 days altogether, which would be five months, uh, the ark uh, uh, touched uh, on the top of near the top of Mount Ararat, and uh, and you would not go down any further. And then uh, when we go all the way to the end, we find that actually Noah was in the ark precisely uh, 370 days. Now, I do find the number 370 tie in, ties in because that's a multiple of 10 times 37. And again and again and again, God uses the number 37 to signify his judgment. The world had come under judgment. Everything that was not in the ark with the breath of life, everything perished altogether. And, but insofar as the The 150 days might relate to the five months that we find in one place in the book of Revelation. Uh, So far as the 40 days, that may relate to our God. This is a a final trial that God is putting the world through. It's a trial that the unsaved must stand before the a uh, judgment throne because number 40 is 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 uh, u- usually used in the bible to signify testing or trial but beyond that i i have not been able to find any relationship uh, to the end of time yeah cuz you know it says it talks about the first the, the first uh, and three times it mentions it the first month I, I, the first I'm, day yeah and, I, I, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, why it does that. Uh, it. Uh, I've not been able to tie that in any way to uh, God's timeline of history, but it does help us to understand the time periods that did take place 
as the floodwaters prevailed upon the world, going all the way from the day the floodwaters began till the rain stopped, till the uh, uh, the ark uh, grounded on Mount Ararat, till Adam or Noah and his family came out of the ark. It does help us to work that out in a precise way. But other than that, I'm not aware of uh, anything else that is being taught there. There okay, may I got be. one more one more question before you before I, I let you go there, Brother Camping. Uh, I I think I've asked you this a while back, but um, do, do you plan on writing any more books? Oh, I've got some booklets that are being prepared slowly on. Yes, there are a number of subjects that I really want to put in writing in order to help uh, understand. But uh, the, that's all <laughs> my my. It's it's hard work. I'm very busy, and I keep researching the Bible. That takes an enormous amount of time, and but slowly on, I'm moving in that direction. Okay. Well, God bless you, and thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Camping. Could you um, read uh, John seven? Uh, Psalm seven. John, John 7? Yeah. Uh, verse 22. 22. No. Psalm or John 7? John. Or John 7, verse 22. Yeah, that's the chapter that speaks about the Feast of Tabernacles. In John 7, verse 22, we come to... Uh, a ver- uh, the question then said the Jews, because Jesus is speaking in the temple uh, during that feast, and uh, they, the G- uh, Jews uh, who were not believers, there's no evidence in this chapter that when it talks about the Jews or the people he's talking with that they were believers, will he kill himself because he saith, whither I go ye cannot come. Now, what is your our question. No, no, I'm talking about uh, John 7, verse 22. Yeah, that's where, oh, I read John 8. Oh, my, thank, forgive me. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day or circumcise a man. If, on a man. if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me? Because I have made a man every whit hole on the Sabbath day. And what is your question? Uh, my question is in 22, why, why does it say fathers instead of father? Oh, uh, uh, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. You see, right. circumcision, with the law was first given to Abraham. If we and he, when it talks about fathers in the Bible, it's really reaching back to uh, the beginning of God's utilization of the land of Canaan as a uh, an outward expression or example of the kingdom of God. And when we go to Genesis chapter 17, for example, we read there yeah, that uh, God said in verse. Uh, if 13, he that is born in thine house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, pointing to an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. In other words, the reference in John 7 is pointing to the very earliest time that the that God gave his program of uh, of circumcision as a sign or a picture of salvation. Okay, thank you, Brother Kemp. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, we're going to have to... Uh, 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 let, let me give the phone number again, 1-800-322-5385, 1-800-322-5385. Uh, 
five. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I have a question concerning Noah and his family. Um, Noah was Noah and his family Jewish? Considered Jewish? No, there were no Jews in that day. The Jewish nation. Uh, you see, Noah lived about 7,000 years ago. And it was about 4,000 years ago that God uh, began to establish the Jewish nation. Actually, it began with Abraham, and Abraham was not a Hebrew. He was uh, from uh, uh, Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldees have to do, do, do with Babylon. And he, in other words, out of the wicked world called Babylon, uh, God chose a man, Abraham and his wife Sarah, to begin the nation of Jews, the nation of Israel. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat a son named Jacob. And Jacob begat 12 sons who in turn became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Hold on, I'll be right back with you. We have a caller on the line. Do you have any other comment, please? Um, I uh, did have one other question, but it's not related um, about the divorce situation. Um, there's, I've been, although I'm divorced, I've, I've been trying to um, find the way what God would have me to be as far as it, I still consider myself a husband, married a husband, and um, how he would want me to care for my family. Well, you know, when it comes to the matter, of, excuse me, when it comes to the matter of divorce, um, uh, mankind has made it very complicated uh, because uh, of intense desire on the part of natural man to have his own way about these things. And we're living today where we see that the marriage institution has been virtually entirely destroyed. Uh, as we see people living together without the benefit of marriage, and we see uh, people divorcing and remarrying, preachers who are divorcing and remarrying, and so on. But when we go through the Bible very, very carefully, looking at everything the Bible has to say about divorce, the fact is God, Christ uh, gave the law in Matthew 19, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It's repeated in another language in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, as well as in Romans 7, that, uh, that uh, the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And so uh, God is uh, truly saying there is not to be divorce for any reason whatsoever. And it's very curious that until about 50 or 60 years ago, that law was pretty well uh, adhered to and followed by the majority, the vast majority of all the churches that professed an interest in the Bible. But it's also very significant that during the last 50 years, uh, 60 years, uh, the, that law has been uh, has been set aside. It's not paid attention to anymore. Uh, the churches have rewritten the, that to suit themselves. So now there's divorce for anything and everything. There's marriage after divorce, and so on and so on. And uh, so uh, the the issue is very clear. But man's desire to have his own way, and and uh, the fact that he is turning away from the authority of the Bible is extremely evident just in this one area of the law of God, that of the marriage institution. Yes, yes, I, I agree. Um, the, what I'm struggling with is the, uh, the language of the uh, agreement that the state sets forth as the, as the, as the separation and a divorce agreement. It, it's in conflict right. with what God has us. How, how we're to be as far as husband and wife. And um, I believe I'm struggling because I have, uh, I believe I have a need to provide still for my family 
whereas the agreement that the state puts into effect says after a certain point of time these these um, obligations aren't mine any longer. Well, I'm not sure I understand your question altogether, but uh, the the actually again let me repeat there is never, never, never an excuse for divorce. Now, two people might separate temporarily from each other for whatever reason. Uh, they may have uh, some good reason to do that, but that doesn't mean that the marriage relationship is broken. They're still married. That doesn't, in other words, just because they live separately uh, for the time being until hopefully something else can be straightened out, uh, that doesn't give any excuse ever for divorce. Uh, and so the, the whole issue is, is the Bible the authority or is man's mind the authority? And you know, I read in the book of Judges, uh, repeatedly in the book of Judges, uh, where it says in those days uh, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. That is very much the world today. Uh, both the secular world and the so-called religious world does what they want to do. The Bible is not the final authority. The fact is, uh, most people in the churches, for example, don't even want to look any deeper into the Bible to learn what it might have to say. They want to leave it just where it is. They're happy with the, with the things that they're presently allowed to do by their churches, not by the, the law of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes. Again, the, the number to call is one 800 Three two two five three eight five, and shall we take our next call? Yes, hi, brother Kathy. How you doing? Yes, you go just ahead. got off the phone with someone regarding marriage, right? Now, a wife is not supposed to separate from her husband. The husband is supposed. I'm to sorry, give we have a bad. Excuse me, we have some kind of a bad phone line. Is your is your uh, uh, phone on or something? Or, or, I mean, is your radio on? Turn it off, please. Maybe that'll help a little bit. Okay. Now, you, you were just, the guy just asked you about marriage. Yeah. Now, well, the first question I have, I always hear you talking about the abomination of desolation taking seat in a holy place. And those that in Judea flee to the hilltop. Hello? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think you were talking about the Obama. You know, again, we just have a bad phone line. I think we'll have to go to our next caller. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, good evening. i got a question. Yes. Um, a few years ago, I asked, I, I told Jesus uh, that I'm a sinner and that I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And I really believe this when I said this. And I said... <clears throat> I believe that you um, rose, that you were buried on the third day, and that you rose again from the dead on the third day. And um, I invite you in my heart, <clears throat> and I said, um, "Please save me." And um, a moment, a couple moments after that, I felt something around me, like a presence that was good, and it flushed through my body for like a half a minute. It was like my body was all tingling, and, and um, I started, like, I had tears coming down in my eyes. Uh, my question is, what, what was that like? Well, I know one thing. It had nothing to do with true salvation. Uh, it had nothing to do with that. Uh -huh. we, we must know there is a spirit world, and Satan comes as an angel of light. And uh, you were following a typical do-it-yourself gospel where if only I say the right things and, and cry to my God for mercy, God will save me. And, 
And we don't know whether he will save you. You don't know whether you were chosen of God. You don't know whether Christ had paid for all of your sins. And, and unless God had nailed all your sins to the cross, that is, had, had taken all of your sins back there 2,000 years ago yeah, and made payment, you can't become saved. No, no, sir, it, it, it didn't happen like that. Well, but see, um, here, here's, excuse me, oh, excuse I'll, me, I'll, excuse me. Here's the evidence. Not that I had a feeling. Not because tears ran down my eyes. Nothing like that. The evidence is, like we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, if we say we know him, and, and to know him means that I've truly become a child of God, we will keep his commandments. In other words, the child of God... Uh, first of all, God had to do the whole work of saving. Nothing we have done can make any contribution of any kind. <laughs> and the fact is that the evidence of salvation will be that we now have an intense desire to do the will of God. I want to learn more and more about what the Bible is teaching. I I recognize that... Uh, 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 that uh, that is my desire that my that is my love i find that it's very troublesome to me when i fall into sin that i used to fall in before i was saved and and that is the true evidence of salvation how has my whole lifestyle changed not the fact that i had some kind of a experience on a certain moment or time a certain feeling or whatever that that can really be a, a trap. That can cause us to think all is well. Oh, my, I must become safe. And so Satan keeps us securely under his care because we're not going to be troubled anymore about the question, am I really saved? Now, see, uh, I was at a summer camp, and this guy was reading the Bible, and I went to go walk over next to him, and this is my first time ever hearing somebody read out loud out of the Bible. And I, sit, I was sitting next to him, and all of a sudden I seen this this huge face, um, and it disappeared off in the distance, and it had a look of knowledge and wisdom, and it went away. And then I was trying to tell the guy, the staff member at the YMCA about it that was reading. He wouldn't listen to me. He kept reading out of the Bible. He was on his lunch break, and we were just sitting alone. And then moments later i went into like uh another vision where i seen my or i was actually i had an outer body experience where i was uh, eat, eating grapes and people were standing around me and humming like huh, like that well i can tell you i can tell you for certain that that was not from god god does not come that way God right. is only one revelation, and that is through the Bible, right. not through a vision, not through an, an apparition, not through uh, something that we see out there or whatever. It, 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 anything supernatural that is uh, happens to us, we can know that it is of Satan. Oh, okay. Uh, okay we want to. We, you want to stay away from that a thousand miles. Yeah, and then I told the kids at the summer camp about what just happened, about the visions, and they said, well, do you want to be saved? I said, yeah, sure. I had no clue what they were talking about, and they told me everything that I told you that I said about, you know, telling Jesus he died on the cross and accepting him in my heart and that believing that he died, uh, he he rose again from the dead on the third day and, you know, yeah. tell me you're a sinner. I said that to myself. I was embarrassed to say it around the kids, and... um that's when I felt some kind of presence, like an anointing or something. Yeah, well, you see, you see, Satan's desire, you know, he comes as an angel of light. He comes as an angel of light, and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. Now, that means he doesn't come with horns. He doesn't come with a forked tail and a red suit so that you can really recognize him. He comes looking like Christ. And his object is to destroy those whom, uh, who want to become a child of God. He wants to make, lock them in. 
Uh -huh. see, if they become interested a little bit in the Bible, he wants to lock them in to make sure they don't get develop that interest. So what happens? He comes looking like Christ, and they have a some kind of a wonderful experience of one kind or another, and then they are assured by the pastors or the Bible teachers or their friends, oh my, you must be a child of God then. Right. Okay, now, now, now think, think of the trap that has been sprung for you. You are convinced, I am a child of God. And uh -huh. so, uh, you uh, you go the rest of your life, uh, under the idea, I'm a child of God. Glory, hallelujah. My sins have been paid for. I don't have to worry about salvation yeah, anymore. Repentant, you have to repent and turn from your wicked ways. Yeah, and, but, and but, but the fact is, that if you have truly become saved, you would recognize, that, first of all, that God does not speak through that kind of activity at all. The Bible says if anyone adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, that is, if, if something comes in the form of a vision or hearing a voice or, or something of that nature, yes, we, that person is still subject to the wrath of God. Yes, sir. And I just want to share one last thing. That, that same night when I went to bed, I, was, I had a good night's sleep. And um, I woke up in my room. Some something was in my room giving these uh, vibes off that were real bad. And I turned around to look, and there was a little, like a midget-sized demon on top of my bureau. And um, the whole room was, you know, dark because it was, you know, time to sleep. And I had no clue what time it was, but it must have been really early in the morning or late at night. And um, it's just giving like a pulsing vibe that was just so evil about it. And I was just so scared at the time. I'm 27. This probably happened when I was about 14. Well, but see, that all figures. It all adds together that this was Satan dealing with you and trying to uh, lock you in right. to think that I'm all is well with me, and actually, uh, actually, you were. He was putting you under his power, not under the power of Christ. Okay. So the only true way of salvation really is to do what the Bible says, the commandments of God. The only way of salvation is for God to save you. And, okay. and in the meanwhile, we are to uh, repent of our sins, we're to cry to Him for mercy, and, and then we wait upon the Lord. Maybe, maybe. God will save me too. Uh, but uh, we are to strive to come into that kingdom. But we have to recognize that right. no matter how hard I strive, I'll never make it. Because all of the work had to be done by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the best illustration that we have in the Bible of this is in the book of Jonah, when the Ninevites, uh, they sat in sackcloth and ashes after God told them through Jonah that God was going to destroy them in 40 days, and they and they cried to God for mercy and 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 declared, "Who can tell? Maybe God will save us too." And God did save them in that case. Okay. Thank you for calling. Thank call you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Can you explain John 5:43? John 5:43. Let's look at that. John 5, verse 43. There we read, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Is that the verse? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, it's very interesting that all through history there have been those who have come claiming that they are the prophet or that they have a special unction from God. They're really coming in their own name. And all kinds of people flock to these individuals. Uh, and and uh, we uh, every now and then there's some name that really comes uh, as a great name and 
and they're ready to trust that. But when Christ comes, no, they're not ready to trust Him. Uh, to trust Him means that they have to uh, start doing, uh, find in their life a really de- real desire to be obedient to Him in every way, and that is repulsive to natural man. And so it's easy to follow someone in their name because the requirement of these are just to follow their rules, and their rules are not nearly as horrendous and so difficult as the whole Bible is the rule book of God. Also, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 10. Uh, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard. Is that the right verse? Yes, that's it. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, you know, um, the more we study the Bible, and the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, yeah, it is through it's the Word of God, the Bible. That is the Word of God. That through this, God opens our eyes wider and wider to God's wonderful truths, and and of course, this is only will happen to us when God has made us His children. And this is what it's talking about here: those who are the the saved ones. And we find that. Uh, to start with, we're amazed that uh, that we don't have to make any payment for our sin, that we are not going to have to stand before the judgment throne of God. And if it ended right there, we'd have to say, oh, how wonderful, how wonderful that God has made this provision and 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 maybe now through eternity future I can be just the most humble tiny servant in the kingdom of God but I'll never have to answer for one of my sins but the more we study the Bible we find that that's only the beginning uh, we become sons of God we become the bride of Christ we uh, we are going to be reigning with Christ throughout eternity future. Uh, we will share in His glory to some degree, and so on. With things that we don't even have any idea how marvelous they're going to be. But uh, this is why it says, "I has not seen nor ear heard uh, the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him." We we get inklings of it as we search the Bible, but to really know, no, we have to wait for God to reveal it to us when we finally get there. All right, thanks. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah good evening, Brother Campbell. Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to reach you for a while. I've been listening to uh, the station since about 1996. Could you turn your radio off, please? Sure, sure. Thank you. And um, I was baptized in 1988. Not that it means real salvation or anything, but I have a problem just like the brother that was talking earlier a few minutes ago. He had a situation with his wife. Um, see, when I became a Christian, I became a Christian to a non-denomination um, congregation um, over in New York City. And uh, I got married to a Pentecostal sister, and um, there's been so much disagreement between us because I don't believe in none of that stuff with tongues and false dreams. I already see what you have taught as a Bible teacher about what's going on in Jeremiah 23, and um, it's so hard to make her understand. And like you just said, that um, you cannot argue truth into them because it's only going to just separate you more from them because um, I know that Jesus spoke about that in Matthew 7, verse 6. Um, Can we look at that for a minute? Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. There we read, 
Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Amen. You, um, does that have any implication to what I'm going through where people who are in other denominations, when you try to teach them the truth of the gospel, which is they proclaim a truth and not the truth. And um, I'm just trying to ask because right now we're separated because of that situation. I have acted in misconduct behavior in such a way, but I really feel that she listens more to what those pastors are saying more than what I'm trying to say to her as a husband. Like you just um, said in Ephesians chapter 5, I still love my wife. And I would always love my wife, and I don't believe in divorce. Yet divorce was in my vocabulary in the past, but I, re I repented from that day. Never again I would allow that because I know that what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. I've collected your books. I have a few of them. And um, they're very interesting books. But I know that you said not to trust in that, but to trust in the Bible and to compare Scripture with Scripture. But uh, I just wanted to just tell you that uh, you've been very helpful in ministering to me the truth. You understand? I know that only Jesus is the truth and the life. And I believe the Family Radio is a, is a, 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 a ministry that holds the whole standard, the whole council. And that is something that we as believers really, really need to uh, take heed to, you know, because I studied many denominations, and hey, there is no salvation in any of those churches because I see what's going on. I mean, look at the situation that I'm in. But I don't want to take no more t of your time because it's almost um, that time to go. But I appreciate And I just wanted you to look at Daniel 8, Verse 10 and 12. Can you give me the implications to that, the, the spiritual meaning? Daniel 8, Daniel, verse 10 through 12. Let me look at that a moment. Daniel 8. Daniel 8, verses 10 to 12. Yeah. There we read... Uh, yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Actually, uh, if we would develop this context very carefully, it is talking about the time when God was finished with utilizing the local congregations to represent the kingdom of God to this world. Uh, he finished with them being used as the custodian or their steward of the, of the gospel uh, to evangelize the world. And he turned the whole business over, that is the whole uh, business of the local congregations, over to Satan. He uh, and so uh, here it's talking about this little horn who can be shown to be Satan, who is prospering and is is uh, cast down truth to the ground. And that's the way it remains in the local congregations right up Amen. until the last day. Amen. And I wanted to say one thing. That's the exact um, answer that I had received as I contemplated on that, because many scholars and theologians are referring that to Alexander the Great when he was conquering all those European nations out there in Greece, and they're using him as the, uh, the, the horn that's conquering all those countries out there in those days. Well, it and is it, it is true that God definitely in Daniel 8 speaks about Alexander the Great, and he uses him as a very interesting and significant type of Satan. Alexander the Great was a very unusual person. At the age of uh, 19, he became king of Greece, and in 13 years, as he only lived to be 32 years of age, he conquered the known world uh, in a way that no one else had ever done. And so he is a picture. But you, we have to go beyond the picture and look right. at the spiritual reality, and that's what we've talked about tonight. But right now we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.